Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, and good early morning, depending on where you are. So today we're host another uh, public lecture on corporate governance. Uh, this is hosted by the Institute for Corporate Governance at Cali School of Business. My name is Jun Yang. I'm the director of the Institute. The ICG was founded originally in 2004. Uh, we've been in a hibernation mode for a few years, a little bit more than a few years. We started this public lecture series in November of last year. So Alex Eichmann started the first lecture on the ESG related issues. So the mission of the Institute is very clear. We want to initiate and facilitate the debates and discussions of important corporate governance issues to advance our standing of governance theories, to inform policy decisions, and in the end, to influence organizational, organizational practice. So for this public series, uh, we have a co-host, actually two co-hosts, uh, the European Corporate Governance Institute, the ECGI. Uh, thank you, Marco and Elaine for your help. And I use Altrum workshops. Uh, thank you, um, Scott for your help uh, along the way. We have hosted a whole series of lectures on the roles of indexers, uh, hedge funds, the roles of the board of directors, and how does big data and new technology change the corporate governance landscape. For the remaining of this year, so for the first two lectures of this year, we talk about uh, white collar crimes and insider trading. So today we have Professor Weirthmap from uh, UC Irvine talking about corporate governance in turbulence times. And in January, we're adding a new one. This is about crypto cryptocurrency. So cryptocurrency, blockchain, and their governance implications. So this is done by Professor Fung from University of Minnesota. After that, we have discussions on exact compensation climate risk, corporate culture, and sustainability. So we're happy to be able to provide these lectures to facilitate our discussions and debates. So for every single lecture, we will send you a link with the video recording, with the slides or paper, and with the write-up of the Q&As that happened during uh, the lecture. And you have the information on the ICG, and our blog series. So the bar barcode at the bottom is for the coming lecture on cryptocurrency. So I'm going to pause here for 45 seconds. You can take out your phone or whatever equipment you have. So that's an easy registration to the forthcoming lecture on cryptocurrency blockchain and their influence on corporate governance. So this is going to show up one more time at the end of today's lecture. Last, I'm going to introduce the moderator for today. I'm Kay Chin. Professor Chin is my colleague at IU. So he's an associate professor of management at Cali School of Business. Professor Chin's own research is in the field of strategic management. Uh, he studied issues concerning psychological and social political factors in top management teams, including CEO, obviously, and their influence on organizational outcomes. His research has been published in essentially all the top uh, management journals, and he's on the editorial board for Strategic Management Journal, Administrative Science Quarterly, Academy of Management Journal, and Organizational Science. Without further ado, I will give the podium to MK so you can introduce our uh, speaker for today. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm thrilled uh, to introduce uh, Margaret uh, Zuizermar today. Uh, she holds the Dean's Professorship uh, in the Strategic Management uh, at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, she has an MBA and a PhD from the University of Michigan, 
he was awarded an honorary doctorate uh, by the Copenhagen Business School in recognition of her remarkable contribution uh, to research and dissemination and education. She is a strategic management society fellow. Uh, she is also an international fellow uh, for the Advanced Institute of Management Research in the UK. Uh, in 2006, uh, she was awarded the Distinguished PhD Alumni Award uh, from the University of Michigan uh, in 2022. This year, uh, she was awarded the Academy of Management Orient Outstanding Educator Award and the Strategic Management Society's uh, Service Award as well. She has uh, published extensively uh, in the premier journals uh, in the field, including the Harvard Business Review, Strategic Management Journal, Academy of Management Journal, and the Administrative Science Quarterly. Uh, she has more than 60 publications and over 13,000 uh, citations. Her research has appeared uh, in the New York Times, the Financial Times, The Economist, The Fortune, Business Week, The Washington Post, uh, to just name a few. Uh, she serves uh, on, on the board of an uh, international corporate governance society uh, and the senior advisory board of the Global Strategy Journal. Uh, she served as a Dean of the Fellows of the Strategic Management Society, Associate Editor of the Strategic Management Journal, Associate Editor of Academy of Management Perspectives, uh, Board of Directors of the Strategic Management Society, and past uh, President of Corporate Strategy and the Governance Group of the Strategic Management Society. So there are so many accolades uh, to add more and uh, some personal episode about how her research influenced my worldview and my research as well. Uh, but we have, uh, uh, we have only so much time, uh, so let me stop here. Uh, so with that, uh, please welcome Margaret. Thank you, MK, and thank you, Young, for if, uh, the invitation to present um, on your virtual webinar. I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, I hope everyone enjoys my talk today. And if you have any questions or would like to uh, connect with me afterwards, I'm open to anything that you'd like to share. So um, I picked a topic of corporate governance in turbulent times to sort of address a broader issue, which is what's happening in the governance issue as a result of the past few years. Um, obviously, we've um, experienced a very different world uh, during lockdown and post lockdown. And there's been a lot of things that have been going on that have impacted corporate governance, but some of them actually date too much earlier. So I wanted to sort of give a perspective of how um, the changing uh, times have had an impact on corporate governance. And before I get started, I wanted to get, share just a little bit about how, how I view this, because I think you have to have an understanding of my perspective a bit. I'm not a finance scholar, I'm a management scholar, as MK alluded. And my view is also different from a lot of management scholars. So um, in my prior life, I actually have an undergraduate degree in economics, an MBA in corporate finance, and I worked on the financial staff at General Motors in Detroit during the 1970s, late 1970s, when, um, believe it or not, the world was very turbulent. Um, the uh, prime interest rate that the Fed charged banks was 21%. Uh, inflation was run amok. Um, we had a lot of global turmoil as a result of that inflation, which was worldwide. And then in the early 80s, the whole world went into a major recession. So that perspective of my background in terms of working in an industry that was hugely impacted by inflation uh, kind of has driven my research um, throughout my career, which means that from the very beginning, starting with my doctoral dissertation, I was very much phenomena driven. And so I really wanted to understand what was going on in business. Um, so I'm not one of these people that gets immersed in a particular theory, let's say transaction cost, and then just does nothing but transaction cost theory articles. I am very much more interested in what's going on in the real world and trying to understand it from an academic perspective and shedding light on what that is actually going on. 
And so my talk today, you know, if you understand that background, my talk today will sort of shed light on what I think are the interesting issues that need to be addressed from a scholarly standpoint that perhaps could um, deserve a bit more attention, especially from the management side. So I'll start with talking about what I see happening. So first, before I start, it's probably a good idea to define what corporate governance is. And there's a variety of definitions, but you know, it's basically how different um, uh, people perceive corporate governance. Corporate governance is not really a new um, phenomena. Um, it really stems back from the first public corporation, which was the Dutch East Indies Company. And the Dutch East Indies Company had shareholders. That's the first public corporation. And governance issues arose from the very beginning. <laughs> so governance has always been a part and parcel of having a public company with shareholders. But here are some different definitions of how people perceive it. But we can begin to see that there's some consistency in the sense of the oversight right, of public corporations. Um, corporate governance is not static. Um, it's driven by what we would call critical events that draw attention to what I would call corporate governance issues. And some of that may be corporate behavior. So if you look at what happened in the 70s, a lot of um, US and European companies were caught um, paying bribes to get foreign contracts which led to a major act called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which was passed in 1976, 77, excuse me, to deal with uh, corruption. This is a worldwide um, uh, regulation. Then uh, we go fast forward a couple of decades and we're in 2001, and all of a sudden we're starting to see what we call um, major misstatements of earnings, um, Adelphia, Enron, WorldCom, all occurred in the early 2000s. And uh, the financial capital markets were almost on the verge of collapsing because of the lack of confidence in the earnings statements of publicly traded firms, which led to the passage in the United States of Sarbanes-Oxley in uh, uh, 2002. And so we again see corporate governance changing based on regulation in, this case, in both of these cases, because Sarbanes-Oxley to even today has a lot of stipulations that publicly traded companies have to abide by. Corporate governance is also driven by context, okay? Uh, a lot of when we talk, look at the literature and we look at our perspective on governance, it's very US centric. Um, and I apologize for that because the U.S. is the anomaly in the world. It's not the standard. It's not the template. The rest of the world looks a lot similar to each other, but the U.S. looks very odd, right? We're the uh, country that has uh, the majority of publicly traded firms. We have the largest capital markets, and we also have firms that are largely owned by institutional investors because of regulation. We cannot have companies that are owned by banks or governments or states. Um, those are all strong regulations. <laughs> Whereas if you go elsewhere in the world, uh, family ownership is bigger, state ownership is bigger, uh, bank ownership in Japan and Germany is quite sizable. So uh, it's a very different governance landscape depending on the nature of the shareholders. The other thing that's driving the uh, go corporate governance our society, it's the social norms that exist within society. So companies are not immune from what happens around them. And uh, a company's moral, economic, and organizational obligation are in part driven by what we would call societal expectations. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how that has shifted and the implications for governance. And lastly, Academia has a big influence. Um, if you look at the regulations in particular, or sometimes the adoption of policies, they've been strongly driven by what us as academics have proposed. So uh, Michael Jensen, I think sometimes regrets his uh, seminal paper on, it's not how much you pay, or not, it's not how much you pay, but how you pay. Uh, I kind of forget exactly the title, but it's something to that effect. 
because he's been, you know, he and Meckling are basically the ones that have led to what we call is stock option pay, which has exploded CEO compensation. But an agency theory perspective has driven a lot of um, what I would call policy as well as regulation in the US that we have to somehow align shareholders with managers. So corporate governance is not static. And so we need to understand what is actually driving corporate governance. So what has changed? And I'm gonna talk about each of these individually, but I thought I'd give you a little bit of a roadmap. So I'm gonna talk about four factors that I think are driving corporate governance. And then I'm gonna talk about the implications for management and boards. And then I'm gonna talk about the scholarly opportunity that the, this context prevents, presents itself. So the first uh, factor is obviously the ownership of the public corporation. We know that today um, in the US at least, the majority of the stock is held by institutional investors, something close to 80%. But in addition to that, there's also been a shift in the nature of the institutional investors. So um, there's been a huge rise in what we will call passively managed funds versus the active managed funds. And so by what do we mean by passively act managed funds? Most of the finance scholars know this, but we're talking about the index funds, right? And if you look at it, um, roughly 54% of the equity in the US markets is now being managed by passively managed funds. Um, Europe is nowhere near that number, it's around 20%. But what's important to note is that both in Europe and in the US, the, the increase in passively managed funds has, is enormous. It's almost doubled in 10 years. So this is a trend that is actually worldwide, not just uh, in the US. And um, just to sort of quickly give an intro, passively managed funds usually means that, they, that there's not an active manager picking stock, but they usually track an index or track a market. And that's why they're called passively managed funds. Now, the question is, why have they grown so much, right? Well, um, it, they've grown because their fees for um, their assets under management are considerably less than an actively managed fund. So if you're an investor, the management fees can actually take away quite a bit of your return, especially when returns tend to be low, as they have been. Uh, so a passive management fund has to significantly lower management fees. And so you're going to get more of the return in the passive management fund back to you as an investor than if you put your money in an actively managed fund. In addition to the overall rise in the passive funds, we also have seen the rise of the big three. And the big three are, of, are the, of the index funds would be Black, Rock, Vanguard, and State Street in that order. And um, they're just huge, okay? Um, th this is probably um, a major concern in terms of not only do you have institutional investors holding large shareholdings, but you have three large uh, index funds holding a very, very sizable proportion of the funds. Um, if you look at the overall equity market, these big three investors hold 25% of all U.S. equity. So that's a pretty significant holding. And you have to think about that, that BlackRock, which is the largest of them, uh, is the largest investor in the world. It has um, over $10 trillion in assets under management. And it got there, you know, like I said, the growth in these funds has happened over the last 10, 10 to 15 years. But BlackRock, by being 10 trillion in assets under management, is now the largest shareholder in 88% of the S&P 500 firms. I just wanna rest a second. The largest shareholder in the majority of the S&P and the majority of the Russell 3000. So we're talking one you know, investment fund or not investment fund, but one investment manager having such a sizable stake in the public markets in the US, which is pretty significant. Um, and just to give you an idea, uh, BlackRock has over 5% of the shares in the S&P 
uh, 500, 488 of the S&P 500. So it's not just the largest, but 5% is a pretty significant shareholding for one large um, investment fund. In comparison, uh, prior to the growth of the index fund, the, Nor the Norway oil fund was the largest shareholder, you know, public uh, shareholder in the world. And in comparison, you know, they're much smaller now than uh, BlackRock, but the Norway oil fund is 1.3 trillion. So BlackRock is 10 and Norway oil fund is 1.3. Obviously, when you have this happening, when you have this type of growth in uh, a few um, institutional investors, it's going to have an impact on corporate governance. Because if you think about the old rules of corporate governance, shareholders had very little bit of a say because there's thousands of them, they're fragmented, and they have a very small ownership position, right? So this is why investors don't have much of an influence. And obviously the concentration of assets under, man under management in the index funds has shifted that. And so now you have some very significant shareholders that can obviously have a say. So this question is, are they having a say? And if so, in what manner? And how are they engaging? So that we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but that's the issue that arises here. Even though they're passively traded funds, their fact that they are so sizable and have such a large shareholding indicates that they are likely to have an impact. So I want to use the um, activist campaign against ExxonMobil as an example of the role of the index funds in influencing change. So engine number one was a very small activist hedge fund that decided to target ExxonMobil a couple of years ago. Just to show you how small they were, they held only 0.02% of the stock of ExxonMobil. So very insignificant amount. They launched a proxy fight for four director positions, which is not cheap to do. Proxy fights about $10 million. Um, their key concern, this, um, this activist campaign gets misconstrued all the time. It's always been a thrown at as an environmental campaign. That was not their key concern. Their key concern was underperformance. ExxonMobil was underperforming the industry. And they focused particularly on the shortcomings of the board. Uh, the, the board of ExxonMobil was a who's who of very notable people, not a single one who had any experience in the industry. So um, needless to say, they basically said, this is a board that's not well equipped to deal with the challenges that the industry has to face uh, due to climate change and so forth. So they came up with a slate of four directors, all with energy industry experience and proposed this slate to the shareholders. Now with 0.02% of the stock, there is no way engine number one would ever, ever succeed in their proxy battle. However, they won three positions because of the fact that the big three support. BlackRock supported um, three of the candidates and State Street and Vanguard supported them as well. And so they ended up getting three positions on the board of ExxonMobil. So this is an example of how uh, the index funds can make, play a major role in influencing what goes on in the governance arena. Even though they're supposedly passive, they supported, in this case, the activist investor and the proxy slate for director positions. So another factor that has changed and kind of engine number one leads us into this, which is hedge fund activism. And I know Anton Brav has given a very um, excellent lecture on what is going on on hedge fund activism. So I'm not gonna go into that kind of detail, but I am going to talk a little bit about what is going on and how, how they are impacting. First of all, before we start, um, this phenomenon of hedge fund activism has been, uh, you know, identified as the, the, the one development that is having more of an impact on strategic decision making in corporate suites than any other impact of the last decade. So just to give you an idea of how important this phenomenon is, and the institution that said that was JP Morgan in 2015. So what do we know about hedge fund activism? Well, first, Here's a the data. It started around 2000, 
and it's still going very strongly. And the numbers indicate that it started in the US and then it became more global. And as you can see, um, it's, it's a global phenomenon now. Uh, there's tremendous amount of uh, money being thrown into activist hedge funds, and therefore they have a lot of what we call dry powder to use in their campaigns. In 2016, 21% of the S&P 500 were approached by an activist investor. By 2018, two years later, 45% of the S&P 500 were already approached by an activist investor. And you have to realize that some of these firms have been targeted more than once. And a lot of these campaigns involve more than one activist. You know? So it's not a single activist going after a company, but it could be multiple activists. So this is a major, major phenomenon. And um, it's having a huge impact. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how they impact firms. But I just wanna make you aware that this is not something that's gonna go away given the amount of money that is in activist hedge funds. Uh, who are these um, characters and where they come from? So activist hedge funds are hedge funds and hedge funds are basically an alternative investment vehicle for institutional investor. Hedge funds are actually institutional investors as well but they differ from conventional hedge, uh, institutional investors such as pension funds and insurance companies in important ways. They have very minimal SEC oversight. They don't have to report their financials. The only thing they have to report is quarterly, they have to report their positions, meaning their stock portfolio. They can take a large stake. In other words, they can place all their bets on one company, you know, kind of the roulette table, put it all your money on one number. There is no need for a hedge fund to hold a diversified portfolio. This is probably the biggest distinction from other conventional institutional investors is that they don't have to hold that diversified portfolio, which means that they can take a big stake in a particular company. And so if you start to think about the ramifications of that, that means that you can really study and figure out which company you want to go want to invest in. And as a result, you may actually outperform the market because you don't hold a diversified portfolio. Um, on the other hand, you can also underperform the market. There's always that risk, right? Um, why have they grown? If you look at hedge funds in 1990, there were less than 300 or so and 40 billion assets under management. By 2021, there were over 10,000 and 3.2 trillion in assets under management. So you might ask the question, well, why have hedge funds grown? Like what, what's the reason they've grown, right? Well, the principal investor in these funds, because you have to be a professional investor to invest in them, have been the other institutional investors. So the pension funds ha are heavy investors in the hedge funds. And why is that? Because the hedge funds traditionally have outperformed the market. So in other words, the pension funds, insurance companies, and so forth, the other institutional investors that have to hold a diversified portfolio have decided to put some of their money or park some of their money into hedge funds who outperform the market. Now, that's the demand side. That's why hedge funds have seen an asset flow of this, this sort. Now, the other question is, well, where does the supply come from? You know, why are there so many hedge funds? And the answer to that is, uh, again, uh, based on financials. Uh, they not only earn a normal management fee for assets under management, but they earn 20% uh, of excess returns. And that's a sizable amount because normally that's not, you know, there might be an excess return fee, but it's usually not 20%. So 20% is a lot of money to be gained if you actually are right in making your investments. So as I say to everybody, the smart money has moved to hedge funds and the smart people have moved to hedge funds. So if you want to make a quick, mon quick money on Wall Street, hedge funds is where you can do so, especially with the 20% excess return. However, all of this, this is mostly hedge funds. So these are passive funds nonetheless. But it also, because of the fact they can take a large stake and because they can earn these excessive returns, it really positions them extremely well to become an activist investor. 
Now, why we have active investors, I'm not going to get into. There's been some very good papers written about that. And a lot of it has to do with shareholder communication and changes in shareholder communications that the SEC approved. But here are the major characters, okay? So if you want to know who they are, Carl Icahn, who actually come, comes from the 1980s, he was part of the uh, capital market control in the 1980s and the leveraged buyout boom. Um, Bill Ackman from Pershing Square, Daniel Lowe from Third Point Management, who recently was in the news with the Disney campaign, and Nelson Peltz from Tree and Fund Management. Um, who these are the sort of the big four in the activist field. However, one has to realize there's hundreds of activist hedge funds now, and there's even spinoffs from these uh, firms, meaning the principals of some of these firms have started their own companies. So this is what's led to a lot of different activist hedge fund campaigns being out there and, and, and so forth. So what is an activist campaign? It's basically an unsolicited attempt to influence the firm. And the goal is obviously to enhance shareholder value, in other words, to make a gain on their investment. But what I wanna uh, illuminate here is what the process actually looks like. I've written three papers on activist hedge funds that have been published, and I've got a couple more that are works in progress. But um, if you look at activist campaigns and you start to do some qualitative research on what is going on in these campaigns, you soon begin to find out that it's a lot more co uh, complicated and complex than what you probably think of. Activists don't all of a sudden decide they're going to attack a company. They do their due diligence. They spend a lot of time researching companies that are potential targets. And once they've identified a potential target, they do a really deep dive on the company. I've um, looked at the white papers. They, they publish these white papers on some of their campaigns. The, the white papers are hundreds of pages long. They make a uh, financial analyst report look like a cliff note summary. They go far deeper than any analyst will on the company. And the issues that they're doing is they're looking at areas where they think there can be improvement in value. And so they're actually not just diagnosing what's wrong with the firm or where there's room for improvement, but they're also coming up with action plans on what they think the firm should do. So they're very, very detailed reports on what they think the firm could do in order to improve value. And a lot of the times they're absolutely right because they've done their deep dive so well that they really understand better than anyone how to improve value. If you look for instance, at the establishment of REITs. Um, I don't know how many of you know what REITs are, R-E-I-T-S, but REITs are basically real estate investment trusts, which is what it stands for. But a lot of companies were sitting on uh, real estate as an asset and activists were the one, first ones to identify that they should spin these off into REITs and unlock value. The whole establishment of REITs was precipitated by activists, not by anyone else. And this led to a lot of uh, REITs being established by existing companies with real estate assets. Getting back to the process, before they even buy any stock, after they do their due diligence, they kind of sense out the investment community. Because even though they can take a large stake, they're never going to have enough shares to have control. In fact, you know, on average, they have a hold about 8%. So for them to succeed, they have to be able to flex a muscle. And the only way they can flex a muscle is if the institutional investors, i.e. the normal institutional investors, are able to be willing to be persuaded to their side. So they do a little bit of homework on the institutional investor landscape in terms of who might side with them. And they might even reach out to certain board members that they think might be open to their suggestions. And that's when they take a stake, when they think they can have a wedge in the company. So they're not going to take a stake just because there's an opportunity. They, have, they also have to align themselves with other investors and maybe even with the board member in order to have influence. And campaigns usually start with private negotiations. They you know, try to reach the CEO there's, uh, where they uh, have a negotiation or discussion 
about their interest in the firm and how they would like to uh, see improvements in whatever shareholder value. In the early days of activist hedge fund campaigns, most firms, CEOs and boards kind of, you know, brushed them off. They ignored them, especially the big companies. Um, they got very little traction. Um, and this is because boards didn't even know what activist investors were and CEOs thought that they were just like, um, you know, a pesty fly, they'd go away. They assumed they had the support of their institutional investors so they didn't really have to worry about things. Well, the landscape and activist campaigns have changed. You know, the early firms they went after were very small market cap where they took sizable positions and where the performance of the firm was so abhorrent that it was very easy to get people to see that things had to change. Nowadays, they target much larger market cap companies and they have a lot more, um, you know, obviously CEOs and boards now listen, okay? They no longer shut the door. Uh, and so there's a completely different sort of uh, relationship of how active campaigns start. The last thing I want to say is that in about half of the campaigns, they don't get a whole lot of uh, traction. And if they don't get any traction in their private negotiations with the board or management, then they become hostile. And hostility usually starts with what we call a public letter. And just to give you an idea, these letters, there is no such thing as a nice letter. <laughs> I just uh, to throw one up here so you can see what it looks like. Um, sorry. Here's the letter that Daniel Loeb sent to the chairman of the board of Intel last year. Um, it's just, if you read the letter, I'm not gonna read it out loud, but I've highlighted in yellow his major points. Once the gold standard for innovative microprocessing manufacturing, Intel has lost its pole position to TSMC in Taiwan and Samsung in South Korea. From a governance point of view, we cannot fathom how the board who presided over Intel's decline could have permitted management to fritter away the company's leading market position while simultaneously rewarding uh, them handsomely with extravagant compensation packages. Okay, this is, you know, the nature of these letters. There is nothing nice about them. They're guttural. They're basically laying it out in a line that the board is asleep. Um, they've just totally mismanaged by providing oversight and the company is in dire straits, right? <laughs> and as we all know, the story of Intel is correct, <laughs> okay? They have lost their pole position and they lost it because of investments that they didn't make. And that, that was another story, investments they didn't make because of Wall Street pressures for earnings. But nonetheless, this is the campaign. So I wanted to give you a flavor of how these letters can really change the governance landscape because the point of these letters, everything that Daniel Loeb says here, he's already told the board, he's already told the CEO, this is not new news. The point of the letter, as soon as he issues the letter, the SEC requires you to file the letter. So the letter becomes public. So all of a sudden, all the investors have access to a letter that is just disparaging, right? So it's, an, it's, it's really a public uh, airing of the dirty laundry, that this is the issue in the campaign. And so that's why they issue letters is to basically draw scrutiny and put pressure on the company to address the issues. And so, and letters, by the way, are very effective in adding attention to a campaign. So I wanted to just, um, you know, alert you to how there is this behind the scenes and also highly visible attributes of these campaigns that obviously are influencing governance. And then the last thing that they are really having an impact on is that the number one, re, um, request from activists is to get a board seat. And so they've been very successful. Here's just the recent I, uh, last five years or so of how many board seats they've gained. This data comes from Lazard. But if you look at the overall board seats from 2014 to 2020, activists have gained roughly 1,600 board seats. 
Now, that might not seem like a lot of board seats, but you have to remember, this is in the US, that during that time period, there's really only 3,600 publicly traded firms. So given that most of the time they only get one board seat, that represents roughly you know, a good 40% of the publicly traded firms have an activist probably shareholder on the board. Now, most of these board seats are not actually employees of the activist fund. Um, it's very rare that they actually have an employee on the fund, but they're the activist representative. So somebody that they vetted that they put on the board. And why is this important? Well, it has a lot of um, uh, concerns because obviously you have a major shareholder that now has board representation. So that's a new phenomenon. Um, now in Europe, major shareholders, i.e. the state or the banks, or, in, or even in Japan, will have board representation. But in the US, major shareholders don't have uh, board representation unless it's like a family, right? You have family ownership, then you might have a family stock ownership you may have a family representative. So here we having a phenomena where a major institutional investor is now getting a board representative. The other thing is what is different is that these board representatives uh, from the activists are not normally elected, right? They're appointed. They're appointed as a settlement, as an outcome of the campaign. So they're not even voted on by the shareholders. They're appointed by the board to get sometimes to appease the activists, I think. And so that changes the nature of the game, that they're not really elected. Um, there are proxy contests and activists, uh, like I, the example of ExxonMobil, but the proxy contest is not how most of these board seats are, are earned. Most of them are actually due to a settlement. Now, what's really interesting and why I spent a little bit of time on this slide is that the SEC has just changed the rules with regards to board elections. So in the past, in order to get a board seat, you would have to launch a proxy contest, which is like I said, $10 million. Well, now the SEC's rule change as of November of last year is that there is now going to be a universal proxy card. So what does that mean? That means that the director nominees which used to be, if you've owned shares of stock, you've probably seen the proxy statement, you get a slate of management's director nominees. And mind you, they're all uncontested. So you're basically, you know, if you vote for them, they're gonna be elected because there's no contest. And then there's the proxy slate, which is what the activist has to then spend money on to get to the shareholders. The SEC now ruled there's gonna be a universal proxy card, which means that it's gonna have both the management's director nominees as well as the activist nominees. So what do you think is likely to happen to board composition when this rule takes effect? It, to me, it's quite obvious. You're gonna see even more activist shareholders with board representation because it's gonna become very easy to decide, oh, I really would like to have this activist director nominee. And then I'd also like to reelect so-and-so from the, the uh, uh, management slate. So you can go back and forth between the two. You don't have to vote for the proxy slate versus the management slate. You can pick and choose the directors by being all on one slate. So this is gonna be a bonus for activist shareholders to get even more board seats. So think, about the ramifications of that. So to summarize the institutional investors and the activists, what we have is we have a corporate governance context that's changed. And the change is that the institutional investors who were always assumed to be highly supportive of management, which meant that management and the board spent very little time engaging with them. Boards in particular hardly ever engage with shareholders. Now we have institutional investors and the big three that are starting to have much more of a say on corporate governance issues. And the institutional investors even work with the activists. So we talked about how the activists need them to get their support, but it's even turned around where the institutional investors will go to activists and ask them to engage on their behalf. This is called request for activists, RFA. 
So in other words, even though they're passive, they can go and ask an activist investor, hey, we've owned the shares in this company. Can you see what you can do about X? So this has opened up a landscape that no public company is really ready for, okay? And as Mary Jo White of the SEC, former SEC chair, commented, she goes, the days of old, basically, of not engaging with your shareholders are over. Uh, your shareholders, i.e. the institutional investors, are going to be driving a lot more of what's going on, so you better engage with them. And in particular, the board has to engage with them. So this has huge ramifications for governance. So to sort of provide a landscape, this um, picture comes from one of my papers. When you think about what has changed from the investor side, uh, boards and management are now dealing with it, not only institutional investors, but also the activists. And because of these campaigns, there's a whole lot of parties that become um, a party to what is going on. So you not only have the traditional uh, financial analysts with their reports, but you have the proxy advisory firms that are giving advice to the institutional investors. You have investment banks that are giving advice to the firm as to how to unlock value to deal with um, what activists are after. And you have legal counsel being pulled in as well. And so the whole um, you know, scenario of the capital market has shifted, right? That firms now have to be proactive in order to think about how to unlock value in order to avoid a campaign and to make sure that the institutional investors stay on their side. So it's a, a completely different landscape than what we, uh, than, than 10, 15 years ago. And then to top it all off, it, the media obviously plays a role too in terms of drawing attention to all, all the whole context of that campaign. So let me move on to what has changed um, besides the investor community. So one of the things that has definitely changed is what we would call societal investor expectation. Shareholder value, uh, which has been probably the primary driving force um, for many companies, is no longer the sole concern. There's growing awareness and attention to what we call ESG issues. And, you know, I don't need to read you what's been going on. Most people are aware. The CEO of BlackRock makes this comment, how whether or not he toes the line on that. But nonetheless, he's made this public comment about, you know, how firms have to deliver more than financial performance. Um, what's really changed is ESG. Okay, ESG or stakeholder perspective is not new. Uh, it's, it's very old. There's always been stakeholder concerns. There's always been um, shareholder proposals on environment, societal issues. Uh, what's different is who's driving ESG today is a different constituent. In the old days, it was what we call corporate gadflies. You know, you had the pension funds that would go off on, on a tangent and say, hey, you guys have to do this or you guys have to do that. And it led to traction. Um, most notably, um, and this is going to date me, but a lot of companies had investments in South Africa when South Africa had apartheid. And as a result of uh, societal activism, uh, many companies divested of their South African assets. So it does have, you know, the old activism was there on ESG issues, but it took a long time before um, sentiment was such that companies would respond. Today, the ESG concerns are coming from large institutional investors, which means that there's a far more focus on what they want and how we have to respond to them from a corporate side. So Norway's oil fund, the largest sovereign fund in the world, announced today, front page of the FT, that it's going to be more aggressive on net zero. So this is just one example of one institutional investors from page news of the FT, they're gonna be more aggressive on the investments that they make. And then there's a thing called the Net Zero Asset Management Initiative, which started in December of 2020. Notice when it started very recently. Their goal is net zero carbon by 2050. It has 291 investment funds as members, over 66 trillion in assets under management. 
this came out of nowhere. In two years, we have had traction coming from the major institutional investors on a particular issue, which is environment, right? So what's changed and what's, what's the ramification of that? Investors are very concerned primarily about the risk exposure. So yes, they're concerned about the world warming up and, and so forth, but they're pre predominantly their focus is the returns of the investments and what is the actual risk exposure due to ESG. So here's an example of the amount of money being thrown into ESG funds, because that's also the demand side is also going. But ESG has become a business. Okay, so in other words, investors want to invest in ESG funds, and um, meaning the large institutional investors want ESG funds. And so now there's a whole business that um, is focused on how to rate ESG funds, right? So there's rating agencies that provide ESG metrics. There's institutional investors that offer ESG funds. They offer corporate green bonds, green municipal security, social responsible investment funds. Um, there's shareholder proposals, um, ESG. There's far more of those. They're also gaining more votes from shareholders. And there's a lot more shareholder voting on ESG issues. Now, um, you know, why are institutional investors offering ESG funds, um, which is what's led to the need for ESG metrics, is, you know, on the one hand, the in investors want to be uh, concern are concerned about ESG investing. But on the other hand, you know, there's always a financial motive. You have to remember that. ESG funds earn a higher management fee than traditional funds. So that is one of the main reasons that these um, investment uh, vehicles want to offer ESG funds. The returns on them are higher in terms of the management fee. So here are, the, here are some of the major players that are rating um, ESG funds. And okay, I'm gonna stop here and just say, there is a big problem with ESG ratings. All right, this is just horrible. It's basically, if you think about it, they are trying to evaluate each company based on its ESG, and they have some kind of formula that they use. But the primary, primary reason that so many companies are rated as ESG friendly is that how they are rated is a very lenient rating system. 90% uh, of the S&P 500 firms in the U.S. are in ESG funds based on these ratings. So that kind of tells you that there's all, it's almost meaningless, right? I'm wondering which firms are out of it, maybe the coal firms. Uh, the majority of firms, according to these metrics, are already ESG friendly. So why is that? Well, um, the predominant thing that is driving these ratings is not the externalities that these firms are creating, i.e. pollution, um, you know, use of uh, minor labor and so forth. No, the primary thing that they're rating is the financial exposure due to ESG. So what they're basically saying is that firms are well positioned in light of ESG risk. So they're, it's not really a rating based on externalities, it's a rating based on the financial exposure due to ESG. Uh, there's obviously no internal metrics being used in terms of these agencies don't go inside the firm to find out what's actually going on. They're just looking at the financial exposure. So a big, huge issue. Needless to say, this has led to what we call greenwashing, which is that a lot of funds are really not ESG funds. They claim to be ESG funds because they get higher management fees. And the SEC is going after this because this is a huge um, malfeasance in terms of misguiding investors. And so they've charged quite a few um, major investment houses, i.e. BNY Mellon, uh, Goldman Sachs, um, uh, you know, all sorts of companies have been uh, highlighted as not really selling ESG funds. And there's been a recent report that 24% of funds that claim to promote sustainability under European regulations don't deserve an ESG label. And that study was done by Morningstar. So there's a big issue about how to evaluate um, ESG.
The other thing, you know, like I said, ESG can influence firm valuation. So environmental concerns can undermine firm performance. And so the SEC has proposed specific rules requiring climate reloaded disclosure. And so here again, boards are being the focus. The rules are that boards have to provide oversight and they have to describe their oversight of climate related issues, uh, climate related risk in particular. And they also, the SEC is requiring that there are some directors on the board with expertise on ESG and they're gonna to have to annually report. So this is a big change. This is a proposed ruling that got uh, passed just recently. So what else has ESG done? Well, ESG has also raised the whole issue about the purpose of the corporation. And I won't go into this because again, there's been a lot of publicity about this, but basically the bottom line is it's leading to much greater scrutiny on corporate behavior. And it's not just the impact on the environment, but impact on all the stakeholders that are impacted by what the uh, corporations do. So my last force is what has changed and that I'm gonna put down as CO activism. Now, CO activism is not new, okay? Um, it seems to be new, but it's actually not new. Uh, CEOs have always been politically active, right? I mean, think about it. They um, try to influence regulations that might impact their industry or their company. Um, they spend money on lobbying, um, but the intention is to stay out of the limelight, right? Not to draw focus to the firm, you're doing it under, under um, you know, trying to influence what could happen. Today, that's changed. Public expectations have shifted. Uh, external events, um, Black Lives Matter, global warming, um, so forth, have really ignited the public furor about uh, what companies, companies responsibility. And so CEOs, you know, while they would love to remain neutral uh, and not um, participate in the dialogue on these issues, perhaps, um, by staying neutral, you can actually cause harm. And that's, we've seen that recently, right? That several company CEOs have been targeted by not speaking out on what considered major issues. And the CEO, you know, is the spokesperson for the company. So when people want to target a company, they target the CEO. So the CEO's role in terms of the nature of activism has obviously been impacted by societal expectations. So to summarize sort of the ESG concerns and CEO activism, corporate governance context has changed. Shareholder rights are no longer um, the sole focus. There's been a shift towards the stakeholder perspective due to concerns over climate, employees, diversity, inclusion. ESG is now an integral part of corporate governance and CEOs are expected to have a say in order to influence the public discourse. So to summarize sort of the great corporate governance challenges that we face today, that investors play a greater role in governance. And I would say not just governance, but even in strategic decision-making and things like CEO pay. Societal expectations are playing a greater role. Stakeholders are now party to the dialogue. Um, there's more of a holistic view of a company, not just a financial or risk exposure view. And this has meant that boards and management are increasingly challenged. The expectations on their performance have risen. Okay, They have to do more than just deliver financial returns. They have to deal with lots of other concerns. And at the same time, they still have to deliver on shareholder value. Investors are not going to go away if you address ESG concerns and you don't perform well financially. So this really puts a demand on management and boards in terms of gaining new perspectives and capabilities. It also has implications for scholars. And I'm gonna address my implications more to strategy scholars, okay? Because that's my perspective. We have a lot of what I would call implicit assumptions and theories that we use when we look at governance issues in companies. And my concern is that they may no longer be relevant. Uh, a lot of the implicit assumptions about governance are really out of date. 
this notion that shareholders have very little influence on boards and very little influence on management is an implicit assumption in much of the management literature, and we need to throw that one out the window. Investors are having huge impact on strategy decisions, as well as governance decisions, and we need to realize that they are party to how firms are managed and what their strategic decision making looks like. Theoretically, we've been over-reliant on one theoretical framework called agency theory to understand the phenomena of governance. And if you look at some of the things that are going on, there are lots of other explanations for some of the behaviors you see. It isn't always a misalignment of interest. And then I want to talk a little bit about our conventional strategy frameworks. Strategy as a field kind of looks at companies with clearly defined firm boundaries. So we have this notion that a company has a nice big black line around it and with regards to its environment, meaning all the other constituents outside the firm. And that the firm somehow controls all its inputs and all of its outputs. And this is sort of, you know, I guess, you know, no one states this in any textbook, but they're implicit assumptions in how we think about strategy and governance in companies. And in reality, this is not, this doesn't exist anymore. First of all, if you look at the largest companies in the US, they're almost all platform based. So the notion that there are neat organizational boundaries doesn't even apply to a platform based company. The inputs and the outputs are no longer controlled by the firm itself, 100%, right? You cannot control the outputs for sure. So you have that problem of understanding how firms really work when boundaries are no longer so determined. And then the other thing is that um, even firms that are traditional firms, you still see that their boundaries have shifted, right? So um, as I said, strategy scholars in understanding the governance context have to recognize that firms are no longer um, kind of isolated from events outside. And not only that, they're interacting in an environment where even what they do is influenced by actors outside of their control. So some research challenges and opportunities I wanna highlight is for management scholars in particular, the importance of externally based mechanisms of governance, right? For too long, we've focused on the internal monitors, you know, the board. And in fact, the external market um, characters, i.e. capital markets constituents, are playing a huge, huge role. And we need to start addressing what, how they are influencing um, companies and governance. There's a lot more engagement going on between institution investors and management and the board. And there's very little research that addresses the nature of that engagement. And as management scholars, we really have an opportunity to address this because you're not gonna get at this by looking at large scale empirical databases. The only way you're gonna understand what's going on here is to get in there and find out how investors, what investors are doing and what kind of engagements they're actually having by talking to managers and boards about those engagements. So there's a real opportunity, but it's also a challenge in the sense that you're not gonna get this out of the CompuStat database, okay? Uh, Another ch research challenge, uh, societal investor expectations have shifted, right? So stakeholder claims. We know that there's a lot more um, of a stakeholder perspective. We know that firms now have to deal with stakeholder claims, but how are these stakeholder claims actually perceived? Um, there's not a lot of research on that. Um, boards, CEOs, investors, they have different perceptions of these stakeholder claims, whether or not they're legitimate, whether or not they're a priority. Um, we need to understand the perceptions, like how are, how are companies and their boards actually perceiving these claims and um, what's really driving the perception of these claims. Uh, you know, boards tend to be um, not as, what we call current with maybe societal expectations, because a lot of these societal expectations are driven by younger people in terms of environment, especially. But nonetheless, when you think about perceptions, I mean, Carl Icahn, I think he's in, well into his 80s, started a campaign against McDonald's about um, 
um, environmental issues because of his granddaughter, okay? <laughs> She's the one that precipitated the campaign. So you have to think about, you know, how are, what are the perceptions that are going on here in the board suite and among managers and who's driving these perceptions? And then I'm gonna go back to my uh, pet peeve about assessing ESG performance. The ESG fund disclosures, the company level metrics need to be addressed. And I am a big champion of having companies address this challenge because ultimately there is no such thing as a universal um, metric for environment, okay? You might be able to say, okay, we can have universal metrics for governance things, but how can you measure environmental uh, effects uh, generically across all these different industries? It doesn't make any sense, right? Certain industries by the nature of their industry are just gonna be dirtier industries and have far more complex supply chains than other industries. So if you're in manufacturing and you have this very extensive global supply chain, how do you manage concerns over environment is a far more complex question than if all you're doing is you know, uh, uh, providing some kind of service uh, to a, a firm, like let's say an advertising firm. So you have to think about these metrics from an industry company level perspective. And so the industries and companies in that industry really need to drive the ball there in terms of defining appropriate metrics for a particular industry. Um, so this is a huge issue because right now, a lot of these metrics are being driven by investment advisors, i.e. the, the you know, rating agencies, or they're being driven by uh, risk metrics, which does a horrible job because they're getting paid by the companies in order to deliver their metrics. So it's an issue that presents a challenge because when scholars wanna look at ESG performance, they rely on these metrics, which are so faulty. So to summarize, okay, uh, hopefully I've kind of illuminated what I would say are the external events impacting corporate governance. And what the conclusion is basically is that boards, the principal oversight vehicle, the monitor of management, are in the hot seat. Um, being a board member is not an easy job. They have to account for not just shareholders, but now also broadly stakeholders. They have to better engage with their investment community, the firm's investors, and they have to be aware of stakeholder concerns. Uh, SOX made them responsible for assessing companies' risk, but that company's risk now incorporates a lot of different issues. I've talked about you know, ESG concerns and so forth, but there are other issues too, just technology obsolescence, cybersecurity. There's a lot on the board's plate when it comes to assessing the company's risk. And the board capabilities are obviously very challenged. You know, The ability to have the knowledge and expertise to provide that oversight is probably lacking in most boards. And investors demand it. They want better risk assessments. They want better uh, disclosure of ESG, uh, SEC is requiring it. The EU is moving in the same direction with the legislation. So ultimately boards are the ones that are gonna be held accountable for governance. And this is happening across the, you know, the EU as well as the US. A lot of that driven legislation in the EU is driven by the EU, but some of it is very specific. Like in Italy, Italian companies, even private ones have to have somebody on the board that actually engages with the with management on ESG issues. So this is coming across, you know, from a variety of different perspectives, but everybody understands boards have to step up and do more. So I think the change context, um, the uh, advantage of the context is that it provides a huge opportunity for research that hasn't happened, right? Research to examine all these issues and how it's driving companies and how it's influencing decision-making. So I think it's, it provides a phenomenal opportunity because if the world was static, then we wouldn't have to research it. But because it's not, it provides a lot of opportunities to better understand what's going on. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, so thanks so much for uh, this very insightful uh, lecture. Uh, and. Uh, uh,
uh, your interpretation uh, on the, the very important timely, uh, you know, topic and phenomenon. Uh, so we, we do have some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so I, I, will, uh, I guess uh, I can just go uh, start with the first one. Um, so there is a question about how do we understand uh, the seemingly divergent trends of a more prevalent passive investing and the active hedge funds and then associated activism at the same time. So I guess the question is more about, uh, you know, there is the different types of, you know, investors and they try to, you know, uh, influence, uh, you know, for different agendas for the companies. Uh, so I, I guess this question is more about uh, how can we have like overall understanding uh, so, so about these uh, um, uh, different types of pressures from um, the different sources. Um, so I, I get it. I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but the I think it deals with the relationship between the activists and the passive institutional investors, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I kind of alluded to that. There's definitely a dialogue between activist investors and institutions, and they have certain institutional investors that they know are going to be more receptive to their um, campaigns than others. And so they have, you know, good working relationship with the institution. So let's say they go after one firm and they've succeeded in improving the shareholder value and therefore having a gain on the investment, which means the institution investor has also made a gain. Then the next campaign, they're going to have a more um, warm reception given their track record, right? So this is one of the reasons they've gotten so much traction is that they have succeeded in moving the dial and improving shareholder value, especially when it comes to unlocking value, like through divestitures and spinoffs. If you look at that, that's a huge uh, value unlocking. Um, when a company gets acquired, that's a huge value gain for the shareholders. So um, the activists have an audience, um, and I think um, the passive institutional investors are more willing to participate. Um, the index funds for sure are more willing to participate um, because they start to vote and actually vote with the, with the activists on a proxy card. But you don't need to have a proxy to have the influence of the institutional investors uh, what's starting to happen is that management knows who the institutional investors are in the, sh in the firm, and they start to engage with them, and they start to sense them. So I'll just give an example. When DuPont was attacked um, by um, an activist quite a while ago, the board actually went to bat for the CEO and went to Wall Street to try to convince the institutional investors that the activist campaign uh, was not the only solution, that they that management had come up with their own way of unlocking value for DuPont. And they spent quite a bit of money. You know, they hired an investment bank and coming up with solutions and then selling it to Wall Street. So they actually went and sold the uh, opposing sort of argument to the major institutional investors of DuPont. And um, they won, you know, the proxy, um, uh, the activists lost the proxy contest for board seats and for what they were asking, and DuPont won the game. So you can see that management at the same time is trying to also appease the institutional investors. Now, in the case of DuPont, it turned out the activists won in the long run, because even though they had lost the proxy contest, the next quarter's results were still below earnings expectations. The board all of a sudden decided they'd had enough of Ellen Coleman as CEO. She was fired, stock went up 5%, and the company went ahead with the plans that the activist investor wanted, which was to merge with Dow and split into three companies. Mm -hmm. So it just shows you how the landscape can change very, very quickly based on events, right? Uh, and DuPont's the oldest traded company on the U.S. Stock, New York Stock Exchange. And so that if they're not immune, then who is? Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. We, we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, other questions, uh, but uh, I was uh, I was also actually you know was personally curious about your thoughts. We have one question about this uh, uh, political polarization. So how how can we uh, you know incorporate this current political you know polarization into you know <laughs> corporate governance challenges? Would there be you know any 
Uh, I, I'd rather not go there. Okay. <laughs> you have to remember I'm in California. Okay. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, and I, I just, I'll just leave it as a joke. When I go to Europe, I do not say I'm from the U.S. I say I'm from California because that at least defines me. I am not a crazy person, okay? Because they think all Americans are crazy, especially in the last four years, right? So um, I don't know how to address the political polarization. I'm not an expert on that, and I don't want to become an expert on that. Sure, sure. I think the question was related, you know, to the CEO activism and those, you know, oh, okay. price shows. Yeah, is a problem. Yeah. And it's that, you know, you you whoever they can't be neutral, which is what they would prefer to be. Mm -hmm. And if they state their case, like let's say on a climate thing, they state their case that they are making out attempts to be zero, net zero by 2050, then the next thing you know, um, the state of Texas decides that you can't invest in the state or you can't buy bonds or whatever. You know, they take retaliation and then the state of Florida does. And then, you know, <laughs> right. so all this political re repercussion of what they do, regardless of which direction they go. So there's like no, you cannot win 100%. So you have to decide. But, you know, I, I'm sure CEOs would prefer not to be party to the discourse on some of these issues. I think on climate, a lot of them do want to be party, but on some of these ESG issues that are more sensitive, they're less likely to want to be party. But on the other hand, societal expectations are saying, hey, you guys, uh, we're consumers, we're concerned, right? So there's an issue. But I will say one thing, consumers are very skittish, you know, on the one hand, they're very concerned about the environment, especially the younger generation, um, which I'm not part of. But on the other hand, their behavior defies their um, concerns. I mean, fast fashion, it's not, a, it's a, not an industry I partake in, but fast fashion, that is the most destructive industry from, from an environmental standpoint that I can think of that's a consumer-driven industry. And that is exactly the same audience as the ones that are cl climbing for cl climate zero. So it's like, on the one hand, they want a zero carbon footprint, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, they're buying God knows hundreds of items from China made by slave labor and um, having huge environmental impact because it's thrown in the trash can within months. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm sorry. I think I, uh, you know, uh, that you know, for job at time management, but uh, 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 we have so many questions. But uh, so we're running out of, out of time. June, uh, so would you like to take? <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, this is more than one lecture because we have the shareholder rights, we have the board of directors, we touch on CEO compensation and the ESC, everything in one lecture. This is the first time we run over time in our public lecture because of the contents and all these questions. Uh, thank you so much. Our next lecture is on uh, the cryptocurrency and blockchains. And actually cryptocurrency, especially blockchain, was created to address some corporate governance issues, especially the centrality issue. But the recent crash of FTX uh, just highlight the potential problems of this solution to potential corporate governance problems, right? So we have a new problem while well, we're trying to solve the classic problems. So can cryptocurrency and blockchain address corporate governance challenges after all? So Professor Vivian Fong is going to share her perspective on January 19th uh, with all of us. So we've created a barcode. Uh, if I can move my slide, I'm going to keep this one on my screen for another 45 seconds. And after this, we do have a lecture in February talking about CEO compensation. We talk about climate risk in March. We talk about corporate, corporate culture in April. And then we have consumers perspective on sustainability. So uh, Margaret, you started the discussion touching on all the aspects, which is a great, very great starting point for all the five subsequent lectures. Thank you so much. Uh, some of the questions were not answered, but um, uh, the answers from our speaker will be emailed to all of the participants and will be posted on our blog. Thank you again for participating in our public lecture and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And like I said, um, feel free, please feel free to reach out if you have questions that we didn't get to. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank Good you.